I am unashamed. What about you? So welcome back to Unashamed. We uh, we were we're jockeying for who's who's kicking off the podcast today. Jess, you you won the you won the kick off the podcast cold open award, so you get to start. Dad's got a hot take for later, but and by the way, let me just mention ahead of time before we get started. I'm having some work done here on the southern layer, so if you hear any sawing or hammering, don't don't you don't worry about me. I'm okay. It's, I'm fine here. It's just uh, just some workers outside. So I wanted to let let you know that right off the bat. All right. Well, good. Well, I guess that means you actually let off the podcast. So <laughs> I guess I did. That's true. He stole well, the last two podcasts was just sheer Bible study, which is great. But every once in a while, things happen in life that we like to share. And, you know, you try to relate them to what we're doing here. And I've had this saga going on for years because all of my brothers live on the same road and there's a gate and even though al spends most of his time at his southern lair he has he has a house on on the road just just outside the gate by the way i'm not i'm not quite inside the gate i'm just outside the gate we're in town and my brother Willie put a pond in the middle of this neighborhood, which is a family neighborhood, literally. Well, that that one act for us being wilderness people and living off the land has caused some some adventure and excitement and reconnaissance missions. Because I would rather visit God's grocery store. And I, what I mean by that is the wilderness and the waters to obtain my supper. And so what happened was one day Willie went down to his pond and he didn't catch any fish. So instead of saying, you know, I need to, I need to fish harder or I maybe need to try a different bait. He looked over across the street and saw my house and said, that doggone Jace has caught all my fish. That's kind of what started the the little love spat here. And none, none of this is serious because he's like, yeah, you can you can catch catch my fish, but leave me some money the next time I want to restock it. That was kind of how this goes. <laughs> so when this was brought to my attention, I said, Willie, I didn't catch all your fish. You're not going to catch all these fish out of here. It's impossible. Well, I was a commercial fisherman for years, and fish are fish. God put something in them, the chase, going back to Genesis 9, where you're just not going to catch them all. They're in there. So he drains the pond, but he didn't drain it all the way because he said, no, i got to restock it. He, he didn't believe me that they were still in there. So he restocks it. So this, is, this happened a couple years ago. And then he said, don't, don't go out here and catch the fish now because I stocked it and they're all too small for table fare. So that's kind of the narrative where we're at. I've shared this before. So yesterday I had a hankering for some fish. So I went out there and it's been enough time now to where they should be just big enough to catch. So I go down there. I don't catch any right at first and I flip my little jig over in a little narrow spot amongst some grass and all of a sudden I see my line take off. It was taking off so rapidly that I thought, well, it must be a bass because the bat, most of the bass still made it, according to Willie. And so when I set the hook, I mean, it was started pulling the drag. It was a fight. I'm like, yeah, it's definitely a bass. And all of a sudden, the surface of the water breaks, and I see this giant crappie. Too big to be one of these that he's recently stocked. And I'm saying within, you know, a year or so, this thing was a giant. And if you're having trouble believing me, I took a picture of it that we can now insert. And what's crazy, it's the only fish I caught. But it was big enough that it could actually feed a party of one, which would be me because I'm a bachelor right now. Missy's in Nashville. (laughs) You're like, you hate, you, the whole meal was one fish. Yep. 
monster. I'm going to guess at two and a half pounds. And so I had some, I, I decided to blacken it on my little griddle. I put some green beans in butter, put the black pepper on the green beans and I put a little olive oil on, and that was my that was my supper last night. But it told me something. Now, if I told you this story, because the practical application I want to make is it was the belief that no crappie could have survived the draining of this. So you got to think there's one or two things that happen. Either somebody's wrong here that we didn't catch all the fish, or it was a miracle. How did I catch this fish? How did it survive? It was, it was no miracle. <laughs> you never get them all out there. It's not a miracle. You're dude. right. Based on we we've been studying, this was my thought. I thought I need to take a picture of this because if I don't, people won't believe me. Because there's doubt here. I have one party saying there's no more fish out there from the original stocking. That comes from people, amateurs, not not knowing much <laughs> about fish. Yeah. Mm. So my That's point some, is some divisions. <laughs> so my point is, since I had the pitch, I have an I have an image of the fish, and that's what Jesus is. When it comes to God, he's the image. So we read it. This this Bible becomes a picture when you read it. So, but you say, well, when Jesus was here, why would they believe him? I'm sure they were doubted. They were doubting him. And, and a lot did because of what the belief system that came along with how they were raised and God's original plan. And so then... It would be one thing for me to convince Willie that there's still fish out there because I have a picture. But if I was going to try to convince somebody that I made all the fish and I become one of the fish to save all the fish, well, then I think that would be such a crazy idea that maybe having the miraculous powers would be a good thing to sell that idea. Because basically when Jesus became a man, God becoming a man is so unbelievable because there's people literally looking at him saying, I don't believe you. And he does miracles. So I just think based on our prior discussion, I'm linking something that happened with kind of how we're approaching the Bible. So I thought I would share that. Well, so have you shown Willie? The, did you send him a copy of the picture yet? No, because there I'm in a tough spot. If I send him the picture, <laughs> he knows your fish. He will now, because <laughs> he never saw him, and I, I went and went down there about dark. And even though I'm right, I don't want to <laughs> share with him that I'm right, because then I got to deal with how come you're down there fishing again. So I'm in a That's tough funny. spot. I can That's share it funny. because he's probably not listening to this. But be sure be, yeah. if you see him. Don't you see him. Willie, and you're listening to the sound of my voice. Tell him. I would say if we had to cut this little story off right now, <laughs> uh, it'd be a plus. <laughs> you know, the subdivision boys fighting over whether there's any fish left or not. I don't know. You run out of something to do or something. I wanted to tell a cool story, and y'all get to see a picture of the beast that I caught yesterday. What a beautiful fish. And if you want to know how to cook it, you go watch uh, Jace's first cooking episode, which there was crappie, right? It was. It was, it was it crappie. It was a crappie. Well, yeah. let's see now if uh, we dive into this, since this is a podcast, and I don't know how. Uh, yeah, I don't What's know What's your how. take on it, Phil? Oh, my take on it, you know, is a lot of people see y'all catch for fish from time to time. But uh, fishing, you know, here today, gone tomorrow. But uh, <laughs> Jesus loved fish. I like that. <laughs> I've got 10 things right here that the book of Acts should be famous for. 10. All right. 10 we got things. Breaking news. 10 things the book of Acts should be we famous heard the, for. We heard the, the not so We heard Jason's take. Not so cold, but pretty cold. <laughs> Beginning in Acts chapter 2, when uh, the people heard this, heard, let all Israel be assured of this. 
God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard it, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, what shall we do? Now that we found out that Jesus died for us, was buried and raised from the dead. Peter replied, repent. This is the first time this is mentioned in the book of Acts. Peter replied, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins will be forgiven. It's a big deal. And you will receive, on top of that, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the promises for you, your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord God will call. With many other words, he warned them. Peter, he pleaded with them. Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Well, look out. Those who accepted, and I didn't count this as one. I counted it, uh, uh, two. I just counted it as one about what this, what's the book of Acts all about. Peter replied, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. That's the first story about what the book of Acts is going to be about. Acts 2.38 is what I read from. The next baptism spree starts in Acts 8, verse 12 and 13. After that, Acts 8, 36 and 38. After that, Acts 9, 18 and 19. Five, the fifth one. Acts chapter 10, 47, 47, 48. Sixth, Acts 13, 24. John, re, 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 and, and baptism. Seven, the book of Acts, 16, 15, Lydia. Eight, Acts 16, 32, the jailer and all his family. It's one group after the other, reaching in, above, up, down, on any way you can, to get Jesus died, was buried, and raised from the dead. Acts 16, 32, jailer and his family. Verse 33, same thing. Acts 18, 8. Which one is that? Uh, it's, it's, in the, it's in the rack. Acts 18, 25, for nine times. 9, 3, verse 4. The tenth time it's mentioned, the Apostle Paul talking about his conversion. He mentions it twice. This is the second time. Acts 22, 16. Paul again. From one end to the other. Faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and baptism in water. That's what the book of Acts is from start to finish. There's 10 occasions where people are told to put their faith in Jesus and be baptized in water. 10 now, one, okay, but ten, and that's what the book of Acts is about from start to finish. Hot take. I can't argue that, Dad. Yeah, I, th I, think, uh, I think a lot of people probably are. I I've just noticed that people typically respond out of fear and uh, uh, like an overreaction. And I think maybe uh, people not emphasizing water baptism enough is, is – Sometimes it's in a reaction to, to say, and it's not the water that saves you. It's, it's you're saved by Jesus, and the water is is a Romans six is pretty clear about it. It's a this this water is a symbol of it's you're 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 dying with Christ. You're being buried with Christ and raised with Christ, and that that water is a symbol of a grave that you're going down into and you're coming back out of. So one of our sponsors uh, is a group called NetSuite by Oracle, and uh, Jace, I know that uh, you're familiar with the uh, parent company with Oracle. Yeah, I'm not that familiar, but I do own a few shares in my portfolio. So I know they're a software company and you can tell us more about NetSuite. So uh, NetSuite, basically, you know, if you, you've got a business, you're going along great, but you start falling behind and then you start getting buried in this manual work. How do we close our books? Uh, things get difficult, right? And so that's the power uh, of what NetSuite does is they put all your information in one place and make it easier for you to be able to do business. Um, they put it down to three numbers, uh, which I like numbers. Uh, they say 37,000, 25, and one. That's their three big numbers. 37,000 is the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. 
NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system. It streamlines your accounting, uh, it does financial management, inventory, HR, and a lot more. Uh, so a lot of companies have signed on 25 years. That's the number 25 uh, that they've been helping businesses do more with less. They close your book. They close your books in days, not weeks, and they drive down your costs, which, of course, that's what makes your business work. And one, uh, their biggest number one, because your business is one of a kind. You get a customized solution for all of your KPIs, which are your key performance indicators, in one efficient system with one source of truth. You get to manage your risk, get reliable forecasts, improve your margins, everything you need to grow all in one place. Right now, you can download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you considerably excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash fill. That's netsuite.com slash fill to get your own KPI checklist. Check them out, netsuite.com slash fill. I think that there's a comeback. I think a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of movements now that people are um, baptizing people and um, so in water, you know, which, you know, so I, I, I see it kind of as a comeback. We, we've baptized quite a few people at our church um, in the last year, and it's been really special to see that moment, you know, of, of you know, it's a, it's a ceremony. It's a, it's a symbol of, a, of, of what's going on in, in, in someone's life that they're, they're dying with Christ. They're, they're the old man's going down, which is that, I mean, that really is the case here in Acts two is, yeah. you know, they're, this, but, they, but what are they responding to in Acts two? It's not, it, it's not baptism is not the sermon. The sermon is the, is the gospel of Christ. And then baptism is the response to that. And I think that, um, I think that's a, a key point to understand that, that you're, you're actually responding to, to the death, the burial and the resurrection of Jesus when you are baptized in water. Yeah, and we didn't mention this as much when we were going through it, but you know, it it, re- it really is. I mean, John's purpose it, from everything I can gather in why he was baptizing people, John the Baptist, I'm talking about before Jesus got here was to introduce this new thing to Israel. I mean, because we never read about in the Old Testament. I mean, you had the, I guess the closest thing, maybe the basin of water when you went into the, you know, the temple for the, you know, ritual cleansing stuff. But you, there was no water baptism of people. And then all of a sudden John comes on the scene and says he's pointing toward Jesus. Yep. And he starts baptizing people for repentance, to change. You know, something's coming. Listen, the, the Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, uh, Acts twenty two twelve. a man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. At that very moment, I was able to see him. He was blinded, you know, on the road to Damascus. He, he looked around, he can see. Now listen to this. I mean, you know good and well, he, he's a pretty confused man <laughs> for because he's blind. I mean, you know, God's working on him. And and I said, the God of our father has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You're going to be a close protege of Jesus Christ. You'll be his witness to all men. You're fixing to write the New Testament nearly of what you've seen and heard. Now listen to the way this is worded. Now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. You fixing to write books, write letters about him. I mean, if I read that, I would say, yeah, better get on board there. He's not asking for the moon. He's just saying, you're in a situation where you now can see, is it life getting better? Well, yeah. Well, what, what do you wait for? Get up and be baptized and wash your sins away. The blood of Jesus on a cross is going to remove his sin. But that guy wrote most most of the New Testament, and he never slacks off. I'm just giving you Acts. You read the rest of the Bible from Acts on. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus is there. He's the one that said, go make disciples and baptize them. That's the marching orders. Somewhere in there, we got the idea that we don't have to be baptized. 
Yeah, in in, in Acts one, Jesus, um, uh, there's a, a scene here um, about the, about this. I say Jesus about this new baptism, and while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart Jerusalem. This is Acts one four, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, "You heard from me." For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So I think that the water, I think just we, just, I think what people push back on, I think we have to clarify, is that the water baptism is a symbol of of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that's going to happen very very soon after that that the opening of Acts. It's going to and that when when Jesus or when Peter preaches the gospel and basically telling them that Jesus the one they killed was the Messiah, the one they've been waiting on. I'm just saying, everything is taken care of. It's a serious thing, and people are to be commended that when they come and say, I am ai was a little baby, and they said I was baptized. I said, how old were you? She said, well, I'm not sure, but I think they said about two months. I said, had the sins piled up on you in that two months? Has your sins just piled up on you? that you could do about it she said that's what i'm talking about i have a problem with me trying to go back when i was a infant i said you weren't full of sins god didn't throw children in the fires of hell you were a young little baby and you didn't know i said have the sins piled up now since that two months now that you're 50 years old she said you are you are st- st- pointing out my problem here. So we're always looking for ways to engage uh, our community and and other families by, you know, trying to be able to share Jesus with them. And one of the ways uh, that we found from one of our uh, sponsors uh, for the podcast is Upward Sports uh, is through sports. And Jace, uh, I think you and I have probably have done this most of our young life and even oh, yeah. some later as we coach and stuff. Yeah, I did this not knowing it was a program available. <laughs> we, When I came to the Lord as a teenager, we were looking for good, fun things to do that also you interact with people that you can share Jesus with. So, Because it is about relationships. So we would always have a team, whether it was football or basketball. I mean, we even went and played pool at night and would play with – unbelievers and just love them show them the character of jesus and over the long haul it doesn't mean it worked every time but at least you know you're having fun you're enjoying yourself but you're also doing kingdom business i know there's a lot of church leaders out there pastors uh people that are trying to reach your community that are listening to this podcast and to be honest i wish i had known about upward sports when i was you know full-time pastor because they really have everything that you need uh, they offer basketball, soccer, flag football, cheerleading, volleyball, baseball, softball. Um, you know, so they have a lot of league and camp offerings that you can do. They're a great organization. They've been around since 1995. Upward Sports helps you run a self-sustaining sports ministry that fits any church of any size that is looking to reach their community. And you'll be able to customize a unique experience utilizing different sports, multiple ministry options, customizable player packages that add your church logo to apparel and more. They really help church leaders to be able to use uh, what people are doing anyway, but now you're having a purpose of Christ as you go forward. So um, we think they're doing a fantastic work. Their executive director, Kevin Drake, is an avid outdoorsman, uh, loves to hunt and fish. And so they're offering a hunting or fishing trip, all expenses paid with Kevin at a time that works on your busy schedule. So if you want to enter this contest, go to upward.org slash unashamed. You can build a thriving, self-sustaining sports ministry at your church that will reach families in your community. The ball is in your court. Go to upward.org slash unashamed. That's upward.org slash unashamed. Most people, Dad, I mean, a, a big chunk of people believe you were born in sin, like, you know, original sin, the idea. And so that's where that idea comes from. But, of course, we don't think the scriptures teach that at all. Um, so, you know, that's that's how we view it differently. Uh, I do think Zach is right. The, the transfer happens right here in Acts 1 and 2 from the baptism that John instituted, which was to get them ready, 
And then the baptism into Jesus, which the Holy Spirit was the game changer. Now he's available to all. So that's why it's there. And and dad pointed out 10 examples of exactly what happens every time the gospel does a wonderful job of spreading it across the spectrum where we can see how this thing evolved and how the the gospel saved all the way down to their faith. You're, you're dying to sin and we're going to bury you. And then I think it's a beautiful thing and people ought to jump up and down that it's there. In my opinion, I agree. Uh, the place I was at down here Sunday, uh, this uh, South Coast Church, they they had a baptismal thing set up out in their foyer, which is really cool. And so we yeah. we were doing books. All these sudden, these people lined up and they start baptizing people, and they're cheering and hooping and hollering just like we do. So it's happening, Dad. I mean, it's you know people all around the as Zach said, all around the world. Uh, water baptism is there. So I'm just saying what comes forth from our, our lips based on. 10 different stories about how they were baptized and, and, you know, through their faith and the blood blood of Jesus and his resurrection. I just think that people need to be reminded of that. And if you don't ever get that and you're coming up, you're missing a wonderful thing and a dangerous thing. I'm saying, come on, let's, I'll be like them other ones, you know, back in the air. I'm like, y'all need to move on this. Yep. Absolutely. Well, the problem is, I think, when you, if you start discussing baptism, you know, I, I kept thinking about when Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Evidently, they had had these same types of discussions. They yeah. have. And so people started arguing about baptism, and it's kind of like you have the cart before the horse. Yep. I mean, the book of Acts is about the declaration of what Jesus did, who he is. He's at the right hand of God. He pours out his spirit. The kingdom has given birth on earth because spirit filled people. They go, they go around and they speak Jesus first, which is what happened here. And then when they say, what do we do? You know, it's, it's a response to it. Yep. So I believe, you know, when Paul said in Corinthians, he's like, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. So, It's a difficult thing when you try to take it separate and apart and say, well, let me just read you the verses. Just go do it. Because I think it comes from a heart that's cut based on hearing who Jesus is. And then they can read the verses with that in mind. And Zach was right to bring up all the arguments about it because I think it people don't want to stress baptism because they're like well jesus is who saves you you know zach said that which is our immediate response true of course of course well that of course is i think because because you can read the verses if you're just talking about baptism on why you should do it without a person's heart being pricked based on the gospel it's going to be a difficult thing you could have 150 of them in there that's correct so i think it is right we're out to preach Jesus, but it is worthy of note. You read the book of Acts, it does seem to follow the same pattern. These people were no doubt immediately, it. I think there's something to be said about they weren't waiting around. Oh. You know, it was that the one you read in uh, or referred to in Acts 8, you know, they were just out in the desert. The guy's reading Isaiah, yeah. the eunuch, and he, he he's, never heard of Jesus. And, and Philip said, you know, with that scripture, he he told him the good news about Jesus. And the next thing they saw was some water. So, you know, it wasn't a spiritual thing or it wasn't something that they were going to wait and, and have some kind of collective group to say, oh, yeah, this, this ought to be a good thing to do. I mean, he just said, why should not be baptized? He said, stop the chair. But it's still about Jesus. This whole thing is about Jesus. And, you know, you see that where we're going to get to in Acts Jason, You're Acts getting as three. close, you're getting so close that to die and be buried and to be raised from the dead, that's a big event. I don't know how you get around to baptizing somebody unless you told them that. I mean, you've already told them. Jesus died, was buried and raised from the dead, and you stay there for a while. Your sins are forgiven. You can receive God's spirit here. You could. We're waiting on you. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I didn't. I didn't put it, all these rules into into action. I just read the book of Acts and looked at it from 
one end to the other. And they made sure that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus was preached and they obeyed. Yeah. So Yeah, I think I think where I've seen that abused though, the baptism at least, is that yeah, you know, I grew up in a church, a lot of churches that I mean, baptism was the thing. I mean, that was even it superseded the gospel, water baptism. And I remember a question that you would ask of someone, is he a is he a Christian? And the answer would be, Well, he's been baptized, as if that was the the litmus test. And you know, I think I think what Jesus called us to, it, it, certainly baptism is like there's no option like for a, for someone who wants to follow Jesus. Like there's no like option. Yeah, I'm not going to do. I'm not going to be baptized in water. They, they, they're, that's not an option. But um, at the same time, the emphasis that Jesus gives in the Great Commission is is to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I think like with the Lord's Supper is another kind of parallel example to this. Uh, some believe that the that the Lord's Supper, that the the Eucharist or the communion, whatever your church calls it, some some believe that it actually turns into the literal body of Christ and the literal blood of Christ when they take it. Uh, it's called transubstantiation. Uh, we don't believe that. We believe that these are uh, symbols. These elements are symbols. They're not the real thing, but they're they're symbols of the real thing. Then when we partake in them. It's a reminder. It's a participation in. It's a. It's a lot of things, and uh, but but it's not the actual blood of Christ um, or the actual flesh of Christ. Now that would be debated by if you're listening to this and you're Catholic, you probably would disagree with me. But uh, I would extrapolate the same kind of argument to baptism too. You just have to remember that the but the because of, because John. I mean, uh, in, in Acts one, it's pretty clear that John baptized the water. Jesus is baptizing with the Holy Spirit. And so the emphasis of baptism is that it it is a connection. It it is it is a dying to self. It's a it's a being buried with Christ. It's a being raised with Him. Romans six. It's to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I just think it's we have to emphasize that the water portion of that is not what saves you. The water is a symbol. It's not. It's it's just like the the Lord's Supper is a symbol. It's not the real thing. It's a symbol of, of what was happening to us and. The reason why I would echo uh, um, what's said in uh, uh, in Peter, he says it's not it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh. I mean, it's not a bath. It's nothing magical in the water. He says it's not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but what it is, it's a pledge of a good conscience towards God that saves you by the resurrection. And what that means is is that I can't come to God with a with a clean conscience because I'm guilty. But when I die with Christ, when I'm buried with Him, and then when I'm raised with him, now I can go before the Father with a clean conscience, not because of what I've done, but because of the finished work of Christ. And 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 the baptism of the Holy Spirit is what get, is, is 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 my credibility when I go into that. It's the the Holy Spirit is a seal guaranteeing my inheritance. So Zach, I was thinking that um one of the things that all of us, I think personally, and of course the podcast by nature of our personal beliefs, uh, that we talk a lot about is the pro-life movement. And uh, and it's really a protection of life, of course, in the womb. And that probably gets the most press, but really it's all the way through, right? I mean, you and Jill have those same uh, commitments that all of us do. Yeah, it's from, from pre-born to the end of life. I mean, yeah, it's, uh, we're, we just, we're believers. We believe people are made in the image of God and so we want to honor that, you know, and uh, so the, whether that's being involved in foster care, adoption, group homes, you know, all the above, you know, that's all of it. It's not just one part of it. And I love that because, you know, you make family commitments. You adopted a child, you know, be, and it saved her life. And literally now her life is precious to all of us as part of that. So that's what our friends at Preborn, uh, they have the same commitment. Uh, they're more on the front end. Um, because what they do is they empower young expectant mothers in crisis to choose life. Uh, that's what they're about. They've rescued hundreds of thousands of babies, uh, through ultrasound because when a woman is considering abortion, uh, at, and if they visit a preborn center, they're going to get to hear that baby's heartbeat and they're going to be able to meet that child on the ultrasound. And we know that's a divine encounter because that's a life that God uh, has made in his image. Isn't so, it interesting that when you when you can hear the heartbeat and you can see the baby on an ultrasound that that you're much less likely to actually 
have an abortion. Isn't, exactly. that, isn't that interesting? Yeah, and it just shows you that that inside all of us is is a commitment to life, whether we're willing to admit it or not. Uh, over the past 15 years, preborn centers have counseled over 450,000 women considering abortion, and over 200,000 babies have been saved. So we want to help them do more. Uh, we want you to help these guys out. Uh, you can donate to them by dialing pound 250 and say the keyword baby. That's pound 250 on your cell phone, keyword baby. Or you can go to preborn.com slash unashamed. That's preborn.com slash unashamed. We know that uh, the only way you could know, you're told. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. That's the problem, sin. But Jesus removed our sin with his blood because anyone who has died, he's, he's, this is right after, go, go, go be baptized. Because anyone has, who has died has been freed from sin. It's, it's your faith in the blood of Jesus that was shed. You make that plain to them. No, oh, I agree. And um, I mean, I think, I think people do emphasize it. Uh, and, and maybe more now, maybe because we're talking about that in that, in that vein. I, I do want to clarify, Zach is right. We, we don't believe there's anything redemptive about water. Because sometimes not. when when you lay this out, people say, well, you believe in water regeneration. No, we don't. We believe in regeneration and redemption by Jesus. So there's nothing magical about the pool of water, people, but the it's the there Acts, for a reason. Yeah, they didn't believe in water generation. Of course not. In the book no. of Acts. No. That came about later. I don't know where it came from, but but we don't believe that, and the Bible doesn't teach that. That's so it. just to clarify, I, I want to make sure people know that. So, well, I'll, I'll reiterate. My point is, you preach Jesus, and when people want to respond, you, you can go to the the passages and explain it. You know, from chapter three to chapter eight, the sermons were still going on. Baptism is never mentioned, and you say, "What were they preaching?" They were preaching Jesus. That's right. So, it, it doesn't matter. If someone, it's not about setting up a roadblock and, you know, having troughs and baptizing people without them That's understanding down what saves them. On, right behind me, I've written down an air coming out of heaven. You know, God became flesh. There's a cross. Jesus shed the blood right there, was raised from the dead. I got the gospel right in back of me that saves them, but I'm just preparing them. And for some reason, they move on it. And if you look around, not a whole lot of movement going on that I can see around that death, burial, resurrection of Jesus. The gospel is not preached as vibrantly as it should be, I believe. And you want to re re go where to look, if you go to what you're talking about, the 10, the ten things, and that all is around the same thing. Well, God don't want you to miss that. So the year is 2024. And you know what that means, Jace? We have to start taking care of our liver now more than ever. I realized, Al, that you cannot spell liver without live or live. <laughs> Jason, your observations are always so unique. <laughs> well, but, and I looked it up and confirmed it. You cannot live without a liver. Exactly. Yeah, and I don't know where it's at, but I know it's in here somewhere because I'm alive. <laughs> it's uh, somewhere down in that right quadrant. But I, I will tell you this. the uh, You were exactly right. You can't live without the liver. It is our body's filtration system. And the uh, American Heart Association has said that adults with fatty liver and that's what happens. You start having issues because you get fat in the liver. You're three and a half times more likely to have heart failure. So your liver then affects other organs as well. And everything gets thrown at the liver. It has over 500 key functions every day. It helps filter your body. Uh, so our friends at Liver Health Formula have come up with an all-natural supplement. It contains 11 clinically proven botanicals that help recharge and protect your liver. 
Uh, I've taken this product. I have my liver enzymes are all out of whack. Fatty liver, I'm sure. And uh, this product helped get my numbers back where they're supposed to be. So it does work, and it's worked for me. So if you're looking to ignite your fat-burning metabolism, boost your energy, and transform how you look and feel, try Liver Health Formula. You're going to receive a free bottle of blood sugar formula that are going to help reduce your sugar cravings when you order today. Try Liver Health Formula by going to getliverhelp.com slash unashamed to get that free bonus gift. That's getliverhelp.com slash unashamed. Jay's to your point, uh, there's, and this is not in the Bible because it happened in 300, but in 300 AD, when Constantine, who was the emperor of Rome, became a Christian, history says that he immediately baptized the entire Roman army. And it wasn't a choice. It was like a command from yep. the emperor. So that shows you sort of the idea of what baptism really is not about. Yep. And that that you, you could take a group of people and just send a, you, it's yeah, amazing, but he made an attempt. He did. I mean, he, he, he probably had the right thing in mind, but what he didn't understand is a, a baptism in a pool of water is a submissive. A bunch act. of men with swords standing over. He said, Oh, you're going to do this. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you get a command. This is what you're going to do. So yep, that's, that's kind of that line, you that balance line we're talking yep. about that you don't want to cross over. Well, so. I think just when you take it out of the context, it's a silly looking thing. So I do believe a lot of religions are like, you're going to go be dunked under some water. And so it's just one of the, <laughs> you know, I think people from a theological standpoint, they look at something like baptism and they're like, you know, what's, what, what, what's happening here? <laughs> when the Bible it, it, can't, can't shake them, when the, what are you? What are you waiting for? Get well, but that's time. what I, the only thing I'm pushing back on your narrative is because I tried, you know, I, I, I've also read the verses in Acts and seen that pattern, uh, you know, let 10, 11 times. But I've read those verses to people when an argument about baptism came up. And, and most of the times the arguments about baptism are all wrapped around hypothetical situations, yep. which is, in my opinion, the wrong way to have a discussion on any subject. That's correct. Uh, much less baptism. You know, what if I was, you know, going to the water and what if it didn't happen? Or they say, you know, what about the thief on the cross? And they push back. So, well, Jesus hadn't died and been buried and raised yet. What about all the people of the Old Testament? You know, and, and then the, uh, the next argument is, are you saying there's something you can do? You can't do anything. Jesus saves you 100% completely. It's not based on your performance. So I think you've got to realize what saves a person and who saves a person, and it's Jesus 100%. But in God's plan, he brings up this idea that you can reenact this. You can humble yourself, like you said, Al, which would be the opposite of you performing in some way. You're basically giving up. Big time. And allowing someone else in an act of humility, which I think it, it should be taught in the way Jesus was exalted to the right hand of God, because that's what really what Acts is about, is Jesus being exalted and the Holy Spirit being poured out. And then Jesus being declared through spirit-filled people. And that's what it's about. The people that responded, since Jesus is at the right hand of God, well, how else can you respond? He just, Luke just spent his whole book talking about the kingdom not looking like what a worldly kingdom looks like. And yeah. the seed along that was humility, brokenness, uh, those who had been oppressed, all of this to allow a humble spirit. They hear Jesus, and they basically give up. You know, Jesus himself said, carry your cross and, and follow me. I think Deny yourself. To prove your point, the one thing I've noticed, the gospel is preached when people respond to it by faith, the death of Jesus. They say, the blood removed all my sin. I said, all your sin. When you present that to someone, I have noticed that the thing I see the most, Jace, what I see the most coming from people who come from all over the world, right where we are, by on the side of the road, what what they what they live for, 
is a beginning. Tears. Tears is what comes with their conversion. Tears. And, and, and I don't try to make them cry, but, but the human race are shedding tears on their way to that pool of water and we're in the pool of water, pointing them to Jesus. Well, I hope they're having tears because of what Jesus did. And that's uh, my point is it moves you. All your you, sins are removed. It humbles you. the spirit of God. Yeah. So people, I, I don't argue about baptism uh, anymore or, or with anyone. You know, I, I share Jesus, and if people love Jesus, I figure at some point they'll look at baptism as an opportunity instead of something to be argued about on whether you have to. Or you, you start getting into these hypothetical situations, and it's evident, and you point it out, rightfully so, you know, on 10 different occasions, it seems to follow the same response but you don't want to get so caught up in that you're missing on who they're responding to yeah because the acts is about jesus as well as all the rest of the bible i mean we're fixed to go through chapter three and all of a sudden in chapter three and four you see all these prophecies all these prophets of old and he says the same thing this was all about jesus this is what got us yeah to to this point and so you know, That's I, why that part is written down, where they can look at the text. It's written down. And you, I just point around. I point down there. You, they see the cross. They see the tomb. They see the empty tomb. They see the greatness of what he's done for us. It's the gospel. Preach the death of Jesus, his burial, his resurrection. And you can come down and be part of that. Yeah, I've always wanted to push back against what Jace, what you're talking about. I agree. It's like you want to push back against anything that would turn in turn um, our response to, to Jesus's invitation to enter into His kingdom. Anything that would like turn that into like almost like a password that we say to get in. You know what I mean? Like baptism is not a password or some kind of ritual password that we got to do to get in, and it, or even like you know I've heard some people say, oh, "Ask Jesus into your heart," and like the truth is like you don't ask Jesus into your heart, your heart can't contain the fullness of the kingdom of God and the king. I mean, he invites us in. So it's actually the other way around. Jesus is inviting us in and then we're responding to that. But I think keeping Christ as preeminent, keeping Christ as the centerpiece of all of this is the point. And what our temptation is as humans is we want to say, well, give it to me in a formula. Give it to me. And say, what, what can I do where I can check it off and know that I've I've done the thing I got to do to get into this. And I think we're missing the bigger point. And I think uh, that's why when you look at what Phil had read earlier in Acts 19, after the, he asked these people about the baptism they received, and they were like John's baptism. And, and he said, well, yeah, that was a baptism of repentance. That's the one that was talked about in Acts 1. John came to baptize with water. But in a few days, you're going to be baptized in the Spirit. And on the, hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And so there's that there is this connection between the Holy Spirit coming in and moving. And then I, I don't think it's an accident that in verse eight, what does Paul do immediately after this happened? What does he preach? It says here that he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. Yep. And so I think that what we have to remember in all of this is that we are we have received an invitation to come into the kingdom of God. And baptism is is our dying to self being connected with the substitutionary atonement of Christ. That's what we, we get into the kingdom through a substitute, through a substitute payment. And our baptism is what it's doing is it's recognizing that and it's connecting us to what Christ finished on the cross so that we can enter into the kingdom of God and then to receive life in the kingdom. That's a good wrap up. We're uh, out of time. Uh, Jace, that was the hot take that became a podcast. <laughs> That's what we call that. So, uh, <laughs> but it was good because that's exactly where we've been in Acts 1 and 2. So it was a pretty good description of what happened there. So next time on the podcast, we'll get to Acts 3 and uh, and look at this uh, situation of, uh, I call it Jesus 2.0 with the disciples in the temple. So we'll see you next time on Unashamed. 
Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.